Hey guys, this is Computer Techie, and today I'm going to be giving you all a little bit of the basics on what's it like to be in a film production, what the chain of command is, and some of the jargon that you'll hear on a film set. Now recently I was able to work on a faith-based film, and I learned a lot about what it's like, um, how much teamwork is involved, and uh, I was given a little bit of information that I'm going to teach you all today that helped me greatly whenever I stepped onto a set. If any of you all are interested in helping out on a film, I would recommend watching this video before you start because it will probably give you more of a heads up of uh, what's going on and should help you if you arrive on set and you don't know where to go. Now first you have your chain of command. The head haunches of a film are the producers and the executive producers. The producers are basically involved in getting everything possible. They call up everyone. They hire everyone. And they make sure that the film is finished as planned. The executive producers are typically in charge of financing as for giving money um, or investing money themselves, finding investors, and they work typically with the marketing executives in order to let that happen. Below the producers and the executive producers, you have the director. He's in charge of all creative things in the entire film. Now, it's a common misconception that the director is the head of a film. Um, but in some cases, if you're watching a movie like uh, The Dark Knight Rises, uh, in that case, Christopher Nolan was a producer and the director. So he technically was the head honcho of that movie, even though he was the director. Now, alongside the director are two separate entities, the script supervisor and the location manager. The script supervisor works with the director to determine what scene is going to be happening next and what take is going to be happening in each scene. Now, the script supervisor works very closely with the second assistant camera, which I will go over um, a little bit later, and they are a huge help as for getting everybody on track uh, with the sound department, with the camera department, and with the director. On the other side, you have the location manager. Now, in pre-production, the location manager is in charge of finding every location that you film at. Now, location is an area that the set is located in. So say you have a scene inside of a warehouse in, uh, in our movie we did. The location would be the warehouse, but say the second floor is the set. So the location manager is in charge of finding the entire location during pre-production and during production they work with the safety officer in determining the areas that the crew and the cast can actually enter. Now, in our warehouse, there were a few areas that were uh, very old and very rotted out, and we, or we had to stay away from those areas. And uh, the location manager worked with the safety officer in taping those off. Uh, they are the first person and the last person to stay at the location every day. Um, they direct traffic as for where everybody can park, and they work with craft services and catering. Craft services is a table that you can go to during the day to pick up snacks if you're ever hungry. If you're thirsty, you can grab a Gatorade or a water or, uh, you know, like some sodas if you're tired. And, of course, catering are various people that offer food to the, uh, the cast and crew during uh, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Um, underneath the director, you have the assistant directors. And uh, I was not aware that assistant directors even existed, but they are such a key role in letting the entire production go on that um, you just can't do a movie without any. Now, the first assistant director is basically the guy who riles everybody up. If the crew is getting sluggish or tired after a long day, they're in charge of going, okay, guys, let's keep going. Let's get together. We need to start shooting a scene. We need to get it done. We only have so many scenes that we need to do left, so we need to go ahead and start on those. Now, the first assistant director also works with the second assistant director in determining the locations that you go to every day and um, what the call time is for each day, which I will go into in further detail in just a second. And um, they work very closely together during the first half of the day. 
and uh, not off in the second half. Now, the second assistant director is in charge of making up a call sheet. Now, the call sheet is a sheet that is sent to all of the cast and all of the crew every single evening. And on it, it describes the location that we will be shooting at the following day, where um, we need to be at what time. The call, the call time is the time that we begin filming. If you want to get breakfast, you need to arrive 30 minutes before the stated call time. So if the call time is 10 o'clock, everybody needs to be there by 10. But if you want breakfast, show up at 9.30. Now, along with the location and the call time on the call sheet, it includes the temperature, the type of precipitation that's going on, if there is any, so that people will can uh, you know, prepare as for sunscreen or rain gear. It tells what, uh, what cast members actually need to arrive, what props are needed for each scene, and what scenes we're going to be shooting. The second, second assistant director works with the extras and with the talent. Whenever you start off the day, the second, second AD will call up all the talent or the, the cast, the actors, so, and say, okay, guys, you need to be at uh, on location by this time. And whenever they arrive on location, the second, second AD tells them, okay, you need to go to hair and makeup and you need to prepare your lines because you're going to be needed at such and such a time. And um, their, their job's uh, pretty stressful sometimes whenever you're working with a lot of extras. Underneath of the assistant directors, there are five major entities. The production designer, the director of photography, the sound designer, the film editor, and the music director. The production designer is in charge of props, wardrobe, and hair and makeup. Now, the props head is the props master. They're in charge of keeping track of all the props. The set designer is a person who specifically designs the set. I know, amazing, right? The production designer basically gets an idea from the director of what the scene is. So the so say for example the scene is the family is talking in the living room. So the production designer goes, okay, we're going to need um, a nighttime scene, so get it ready, um, have a lot of things that you'll need in a living room, you know, like a like a TV remote or some magazines or if they're eating dinner they can have a few um, glasses and some plates and some napkins and stuff like that and then the set designer actually designs the set however the set dresser is the person who has the authority of touching anything um, once the entire set has been set up by the set dresser it is called a hot set well if you are told that it is a hot set you're not allowed to go on to that set or touch anything on the set. If you do, it could really hurt the movie. For example, if the set designer has a can of Oak and make sure that the camera can't see the Coca-Cola logo, then your, then your movie is going to be okay. But if some random guy from sound or camera accidentally bumps the Coke can, then you can read the logo. That means that the movie is now going to have to pay Coca-Cola royalties because somebody moved that set. And we can't deal with that. So um, hot set is a very important piece of jargon that, you'll, uh, that we'll review over in just a little bit. Um, now you have wardrobe. The wardrobe is in charge of clothing, obviously. The costume designer speaks with the production designer, and the production designer speaks with the director as to what scene's going on. So say the production designer says, okay, costume designer, uh, this is scene 47, and they're all in their pajamas, and so I'm going to need you to design um, appropriate clothing for all the actors. So the costume designer is going to go, okay, uh, how about the girl can have a pink shirt and purple pants and the guy can have plaid pants and a navy shirt and they determine what would look best on everybody in every scene. The key costumer is basically the person who goes ahead and dresses the, the uh, talent. And uh, the cutter is in charge of um, a adjusting the clothing. If somebody tears clothing, the cutter will go ahead and re-sew it. They're basically like a seamstress. They will hem clothing, they'll um, tailor it, they'll make it perfect so that it fits the actors nicely and they fix any problems that the actors or the crew might 
cause to the uh, to the wardrobe. Now, hair and makeup basically consists of hairdressers and makeup artists. Now, I'm not saying that hairdressers are above makeup artists in any way. Uh, I just listed them like that because I didn't really have a lot of space to put them like that. So, the, there's no real uh, superiority in that department. Now, you have the director of photography, and he is in charge of the camera unit and G&E. Under the camera unit, you have the camera operator, um, the first assistant camera, and basically the first assistant camera is in charge of building the camera every day, taking down the camera whenever uh, they need to, and um, adjusting focus. What this means is they use a device called a follow focus and the follow focus attaches to the focal ring of the lens on the camera. So whenever you have a, uh, a shot where the camera op is moving the camera back on a dolly, the first assistant camera uses a follow focus to make sure that the subject uh, that they're filming always stays in focus. Whenever your subject is not in focus, they're called soft. And it was, it'd probably be pretty bad if a whole movie is soft. I mean, who wants to watch a movie where the entire thing is blurry, am I right? So that's why the first assistant camera is extremely important. I served on the movie as the second assistant camera. The second AC basically is in charge of slating every single clip. Now, have you guys ever seen a person who goes up to the camera and goes, seen blah, 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 take blah, blah, and then they click down on the little stick thing? Well, that little stick thing is called a slate, or more commonly referred to as a clapperboard. Now, the second assistant camera is in charge of updating that clapperboard every single take. You keep track of the scene, the take, the uh, card that you're using, if it's digital, or what role you're on, if it's film, um, what the date uh, of shooting is, what the production is, who the director is, who the director of photography is, um, what slate you're on, what frame rate you're using, what camera you're using, what type of scene is it? Is it interior, exterior, day or night? And in my case, I also had to keep track of clip numbers on the red cameras because we used um, a red scarlet on our film. So um, it can be a very stressful job. But um, the second assistant camera gets a lot of help from the script supervisor, like I said earlier. Basically, the script supervisor and the second AD or AAC work together to determine what the scene is, what take it is, and um, the second assistant camera will tell the script supervisor what lenses that the camera has. So, say you're using a 50 millimeter, the second assistant camera will give that information to the script supervisor, and the script supervisor will make a note that the scene is going to be a uh, medium shot or close up. So, um, they work very much hand in hand. The digital imaging technician. If you're using a digital camera, then you need a DIT. If you're not, then you don't. The DIT is in charge of adjusting ISO, color temperature, um, sure speed, the aperture of the lens, and basically everything technical. Um, now, I was very surprised that there was so much involved with adjusting these camera settings. I said uh, to the sound mixer, I said, I don't get why they're taking so long, you know. You can just give the footage to post-production and they can make it look good. But if you don't deliver a good picture to start off with, there's not much you can do with editing. So that's why DIT is extremely important. A steady cam operator is basically a guy who's just meant to hold a steady cam. Now, if you're not familiar with what a steady cam is, that's okay. A steady cam is a device that a lot of camera or steady cam operators use to keep a camera stabilized while moving um, by yourself. So what you do is attach a rig onto your body called a steady cam. And what this rig is able to do is keep the camera um, separated from the body. So if you are shaking slightly, the camera does not pick up any of the shakiness because it's separated using a counterbalancing system. Now, our production was pretty low budget, so we had a knockoff version of a steady cam called a glide cam, which worked beautifully. 
um, but it's more meant for smaller size cameras and amateurs, so we were okay. We had a red scarlet, so a glide cam was okay, but it would have been preferred if we had a steady cam, which are more heavily built and probably more appropriate for uh, bigger cameras, And um, but they're a lot more expensive, so that's why we didn't use it. Now, G&E. G&E stands for grip and electric. The, the N just is slang for and. Now, under the G&E department, you have a guy called the key grip. So before every scene is shot, the DP, director of photography, camera op, and director will figure out how the scene is going to be shot. So whenever they determine all the shots, the DP will determine where to place the lighting for every single angle of the scene. So he'll report this to his key grip. The key grip is the chief of all things related to grip and electric. Now under the key grip, you have the best boy. So the key grip will tell the best boy, okay, we're going to need these lights, these stands, these different types of sandbags to support them. The best boy, there are two. Um, there's one in charge of grip and there's one in charge of electric. The best boy works inside of the G&E truck, which is typically like a box truck. And he distributes different lights that you need, different um, films that you need. And, and film in this case is like a colored piece of translucent paper that you will put over top of the light. So the light will um, give a different hue. And... Um, the best boy distributes all these things. A gaffer is a person in the electric department. Now, whenever I say grip and electric, grip is basically stands and um, supports. And electric means lighting and um, power cords or stingers, which you'll learn in just a minute. Or a few minutes, actually. And so the gaffer um, will go to the best boy. The best boy will be like, okay, uh, here's your lights. And uh, the gaffer goes ahead and works with the grips to assemble stands and assemble lighting. So the gaffer will place the light on top of a specific stand. The grips will set up each stand and put supporting um, sandbags or boa bags beneath um, each stand so that they stay still. And I'll go over those in a little bit. And the lighting technicians are in charge, are in charge of turning on and off lights. Whenever you turn on and off a light on a film set, it is important that you say striking before you turn on the light. This is because if you are a member of crew or cast and you happen to be looking inside of a light, you hear that word striking, that means look away. Because these lights are going to be bright. And if you keep looking at that light whenever you turn it on, you may develop a vision problem. You don't want to risk anything like that. So that's why it's extremely important for lighting technicians to say striking before they turn on a light. Now, in the sound department, you have a guy called the sound designer. They're in charge of overseeing everything related to the audio. Whenever you're shooting a scene... Um, you use what's called a boom, which is a very long rod, and there's a very sensitive microphone located at the end of it. Now, after every scene is shot, everybody must stay quiet for a given amount of time. Why? Well, you have to record a thing called room tone. What is room tone? Room tone is the general automatopoeia of the room whenever everything is quiet. So the AD uh, will call out, quiet on set. And this uh, allows the sound mixer or the sound designer to go ahead and record the audio of the quiet room for three seconds. So they use this room tone um, to lay over all the audio tracks in the editing department so that whenever you switch camera angles, there's a consistent background noise going on and it doesn't sound weird whenever you switch from shot to shot. In an amateur film, you will notice that if there is no room tone recorded, every single camera angle that's changed has a different background noise going on, and it sounds weird, and it looks weird, and it's important for the sound designer to recognize that, and the sound mixer to recognize that. Now, the sound mixer is in charge of recording all sound whenever um, the production is going on, 
and he will adjust the sound levels of every microphone. So if you have multiple people wearing lapel microphones or if filming a scene inside of a car that has a lot of hidden microphones throughout the car, the sound mixer will go ahead and adjust all the sensitivity levels of each microphone so that it gives the, the best, clearest quality that you can deliver. The boom op is in charge of holding the boom, which is, as most people probably know, a big rod with a very sensitive microphone at the end of it. And the, the utility sound tech is in charge of wrangling cable. What that means is they have these cables that run between the sound mixer and the boom operator. And um, the utility sound tech goes ahead and wrangles that cable whenever there's a lot of action going on and the boom has to move in sudden different directions. The, U, uh, the UST is also in charge of adjusting time code and um, different recording devices on the cameras. Time code is a recurring clock that runs every time you film. That gives the editor the ability to sync audio with video. What does that mean? Well that means that whenever you're recording audio and video, the video recorder guy might click the audio, um, might click the recording button on the camera at a different time than the audio guy clicks record on his soundboard. So the UST is in charge of making sure that the uh, timecode buddy, um, which is one type of device used to run timecode, is on and fully functioning and he works with the second assistant camera to make sure that it always works on his slate. And uh, that is an extremely important role, and without time code, it would be nearly impossible to sync sound with video. The film editor basically is in charge of editing the film using a variety of media and software. Um, in our case, the film was shot uh, and uh, it was all digital, so he was able to edit it in Adobe Premiere Pro. I believe he used a little bit of After Effects, but that's mostly uh, visual effects, which I'll go into in just a sec. And every time we needed to replace our memory card, I would take my card to our data manager, and she would uh, go ahead and take all of the data on the card and dump it into the hard drives. And um, once she had finished dumping all the data she'd give me a clear card that I can take back to the camera department or camera unit format it and get it ready to go for the next uh, scene and the data manager she will take all of the transferred data from the hard drives and give it to our editor who would take the clips and arrange it in Premiere Pro to make the actual movie um, our our movie involved a lot of use of cell phones and uh, laptops and because of that we had to create our own operating systems to prevent uh, royalties as I said before you can't we don't want to have to owe anybody any money so we had to make up our own um, operating systems on these things so we used a VFX or visual effects supervisor to create all these virtual device operating systems and they used After Effects primarily to um, to make all these things and that was extremely important to transfer that uh, data to the VFX supervisor so that they can edit it with After Effects and then send it back to our film editor so he can put it into the film and the colorist typically is either the VFX supervisor or the film editor and they just they edit color correction to make it more appealing, more cinematic looking. Uh, a quick note, there is a difference between special effects and visual effects, which a lot of people are not aware of. Special effects are illusions that are produced physically, where if you have, um, if you want to make an explosion, a special effect version of that would be putting C4 onto the set and then exploding it at a specific point during filming. If you want to do it uh, with visual effects, that means that you will go into a computer and make a CGI version of that explosion. There was no actual fire on the set. So there's a very big difference between that. And uh, one of my favorite directors is Christopher Nolan, the guy who made The Dark Knight, The Dark Knight Rises, Inception. And I like him because he uses a lot of special effects. 
He has a great supervisor. Uh, Chris Corbold is his name. And it you really got to pay a lot of respect to them because they actually do it. They do 95% of all their effects using special effects. And that costs a lot more money, but it looks way more impressive in the end result. And it costs a lot more time, but it's totally worth it. Totally worth it. Finally, you have the music director, and he's in charge of um, determining what the music for the movie is going to sound like. He works with the composer to determine what an appropriate sound would be for a given scene. If it's a dramatic scene, he determines that we need to have dramatic music. So he works with the composer to make sure that that happens. And uh, if it's a happy scene, we make sure that the composer writes a happy music. Um, so it's extremely important to have a music director. Otherwise, the entire movie would be like a documentary. Um, even some documentaries have music, but it would, it would just be weird. I mean, nobody wants to watch Superman and not have a big, awesome score going on. And so the, uh, the music director is very, very involved with determining what the music's going to be for every scene. The Foley artist is the guy who's basically in charge of inserting automatopoeia into different situations. So he is like, okay, um, I like the movie The Artist. The Artist won a ton of awards, and um, most of which was due to the fact that they had incredible music. The Foley artist um, is the guy who inserts different elements that present a sort of realism to the music. So there was a guy in the movie The Artist named George Valentine, and uh, the entire movie was silent, so the entire movie was basically told through the use of different types of music. Whenever uh, George Valentine was happy, they would play very cheery music, and whenever he was upset, they played very upset music. Now, the Foley artist was in charge of determining the background noises in associated with the music. So, um, sometimes they would have a big explosion, and the Foley artist would make sure that the composer was aware of that. And that also is probably a big key component of working with the sound designer, um, to make sure that there are real elements going on inside of the music itself. Because... If, if you see a big explosion on a movie, you're going to want to hear a big boom, right? And without it, it's just not going to be realistic. And the whole point of making a movie is to present a realistic, non-real story. So the Foley artist was extremely important in the movie The Artist. So uh, I, I commend them for their fantastic work in that department. And unfortunately, at the bottom of the chain, you have the PAs, the production assistants. Now, it is there's no shame in being a production assistant. What that means is you're here to help anybody with anything. So the reason I have all these lines pointed to production assistants is whenever anybody needs anything, they instantly ask a PA for help. So if you're on a set that's really busy and I need a drink, but I don't have enough time to go out to craft services and pick up a drink. I'll go, okay, hey, PA. If I don't know their name, I just call them a PA. It's not disrespectful. They recognize it. And then I go, I need a Gatorade. Please get it back to me as soon as possible. So they go ahead, they run out, get me a Gatorade, and bring it back. And they're very helpful. They're very helpful. Whenever you're on a very stressful set, if you have a ton of extras that are tired, they're hungry, they're thirsty, you get a PA to run over, get them whatever they need. If you need a makeup person, say, okay, PA, go run and get makeup. Makeup will come with the PA back to the production, and everything goes by as planned. So if you are trying to get on a film in Hollywood, a very big film, you will most likely start off as a PA. That's pretty much 99% of the time you're going to be a PA on your first film. Because um, in my case, I got to be the second AC because it was a very small crew and uh, I w I'm a fast learner and, and they decided that I knew my stuff out camera so I could go ahead and be in the camera unit. But in any other case, 
I would have been lucky to be a PA. And um, so if you are ever told that you are a PA, there's absolutely no shame in that. And you should be very grateful because what you're doing for the film is simply incredible. Okay, so we've gone over the chain of command, and I'm just going to run through a few words that you'll hear on set and explain what each of them means. Okay, film crew jargon. Whenever you begin to film a scene, the AD will shout out, Quiet on set! That means everybody needs to stay quiet. No talking. Don't move a muscle. If you... If the, the sound guy hears your foot tapping or sliding or a piece of paper crinkling in your hands they will yell at you probably so quiet on the set means freeze shut up. roll sound is another thing the ad will say the sound mixer will go ahead and click the record button and go sound speed which means all right i'm i'm recording he'll go the ad will then go roll camera and the camera department or the camera op will say Camera rolls, as in, I click the record button, and I'm recording, let's go. Now, typically, the second AC is supposed to go out, hold the slate in front of the camera, and go, mark, and then they clap it. And then they move it out of the way, and then they continue filming. Or, marker, because uh, we actually had a guy on our set named Mark, and so that can cause a lot of confusion, so you can say marker instead. And uh, in my case, what I did is I said, scene, blah, 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 take, blah, 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 and then I would clap it. I'd move it out of the way, and once I was settled, the camera op would look around and go, okay, set, which means everybody's set, everybody's ready to go. Background. Background is only used if you have a lot of extras. If you are only using voice you, like like actual actors who are speaking, who have lines, you don't have to say background. Background is only used whenever you say, uh, if you say background, that means, okay, extras, do your thing. So if you're filming a scene in a school and you say background, that means that all the extras are going to go ahead and start um, messing with their locker, walking down the hall, chatting with friends, and then the director will go, action whenever he's ready for the actual voice actors to go ahead and start whenever they have finished a scene an actor is not allowed to cut character until the director says cut or back to one back to one basically means all right go back to your first position back to your first line and that includes the extras too so if the extras are now at their point B, they need to go back to their point A whenever they see, whenever they hear back to one. Tails. Tails uh, or tail slate is a very rare occasion. Whenever you have a movie with animals, if you are the second assistant camera and you clap down on that clapperboard, it'll scare them or it will distract them from what they were originally getting ready to go. And if you have like like a dog movie, you will typically use tail slating. What that means is they go ahead and say action and you don't mark it before they say action. They'll go camera rolls, set, action, and they'll film the scene. And then whenever they're ready to cut, they'll go tails and then the second AC will take his clapperboard, flip it upside down, hold it in front of the camera, say mark or marker, or in my case, I would say scene, blah, 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 take, blah, 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 click. And then the director will go, cut. Hot points. Hot points is not a very common industry standard uh, saying. In fact, we might have just used it on our film. Hot points basically means if you're moving something hot or you're moving something pointy, yell out hot points. If you're, if you're moving a big stand or a light, let everybody in your way know, get out of the way, because you don't want to hurt somebody with something hot or pointy or both. Striking, like I said earlier, is something that the lighting technicians will say before they turn on the light so that you can prevent blinding somebody. Typically, the key grip or the DP will go, fly me in, blah, blah, blah. And that means 
bring me a blah 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 and uh, at which point the grip or the gaffer will go blah 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 flying in or I'm bringing the thing that you just asked me to bring in in um, the DP or the key grip will go all right I want you to hold with it all that means is hold it with your hands so they have a device or not a device really uh, a thing called a courtesy which is like a flap of uh, dark material that you hold over your camera operator and your director and basically it, it shields your eyes from the sun it gives you a little bit of shade and it gives the camera some shade so that you can read the monitor more easily or adjust because better Hollywood it means just hold it over them because they're only gonna need that courtesy for a few seconds so just hold it you don't need to set up a stand we don't have enough time Hollywood it sometimes the director will go that's a wrap on blah 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 uh, so if they go if you have a character named Jimmy um, and this is uh, the actor Jimmy's last scene that he's ever gonna need to film for this movie they'll go that's a wrap on Jimmy or that's that's a picture wrap on Jimmy and then everybody claps and everybody says goodbye and then whenever you're finished with the film entirely they will go that's a picture app period and then everybody cheers and it's super awesome and everybody uh, has a great time and then you your hugs and and you see them in a few months at the premiere so that's what that all means uh, talent as you probably figured out earlier just means actors actresses or cast uh, video village video village is a section that uh, only the director the DP the assistant cameras and the uh, I think that's it people can uh, actually be at and basically video village is a cart that we used um, with a monitor on it that hooked up to the monitor on our camera so what that means is when you're filming a scene the director is able to watch the entire thing going on through the camera's lens at a separate location so if you're filming a scene of a girl typing on her computer in her bedroom you can use video village so that you can watch the entire scene as a director without being in the set so it gives the camera operator more space and the cast more space and typically if you're in a small bedroom it's gonna keep the room a lot cooler by having less people inside of it so video village is very important for that a stinger is a power cord or a, a, an extension cord and uh, typically whenever you have a stinger on the floor they will put a cone uh, by the stinger so that you notify people not to step on it because if you ever step on an extension cord it can mess it up pretty bad whenever the camera operator has turned on the camera he'll go pictures up at which point the digital imaging technician will work with the director and figure out or, or work with the DP and figure out what things need to go on the camera and what type of lighting they're going to need and uh, as I said earlier courtesy is a big um, a big flop of of cloth that's used as a shade the the technical term for it is a floppy but it, uh, we used it uh, we called it a courtesy an apple box an apple box is simply a box that you use for anything. Um, Tom, Tom Cruise is a pretty short actor. Um, uh, so is Danny DeVito. So is Sylvester Stallone. And uh, so are a multitude of other actors. And so if you're ever shooting a scene that has two people standing next to each other and you want them to look like they're at the same height, you'll make them stand on an apple box. A full apple box, a half apple box, a quarter apple box, and a pancake are all very useful in their own way. You can use an apple box to raise up a camera on a dolly if you don't want to use like the, the tripod or uh, sticks. Let me write it down. Sticks is another name for a tripod on a film set. Uh, well, never mind. You got it. Um, and the apple boxes are typically the same price no matter what size you get them from um, a pancake is basically 
an eighth of the height of a full apple box. They just call it pancakes because they're about the thickness of a pancake. So that's what all that means. And then you have um, sandbags and boa bags that you use to hold down stands if you're in the grip and electric department. A sandbag is a lot bulkier, a lot heavier. Um, ours were black with blue straps, and those were used to hold down really heavy, tall stands. Boa bags are basically, um, there are two small sandbags connected with a very long piece of cloth that has no sand in it. So it's very similar to like a boa constrictor, and it's typically uh, used to hold down cameras if you are moving them in a truck on a stand and uh, you use boa bags to secure down apple boxes if you're using dolly and uh, ours were actually homemade which was really cool our uh, DP Mark had made all of his sandbags and boa bags so uh, those were extremely important and that's one of the things that the the grips are in charge of so, uh, yeah, um, I think that that is it. I hope you all learned a lot about what it's like to um, be on production, what everybody does. And if you have any questions, leave me a comment or send me a message, and I will try to get back to you as soon as possible. Thank you guys very much for listening. Bye-bye.